Hey YouTube, this is Eric from Bay Fiber Studio. I'm a professional fiber artist and today I'm going to be walking you through five different tools that I use in my practice. Stay tuned. So five different tools. We'll be starting with some of the more easy to find tools and moving into some of the more specialized tools. But specialized doesn't necessarily mean they're any better or, or more effective or more traditional. It just depends on the job that you're doing. Because uh, if you're doing big jobs, you know, a really basic tool like this is going to do a much better job than a really specialized tool uh, like that one. But first things first, the tools that you have lying around. So the first thing I want to talk about is probably the easiest one to find if you don't already have them laying around the house. Uh, these foam brushes that I buy in variety packs and so they come in variety of sizes and they work great for a number of things not just a lot of heavy weight uh, covering a lot of mileage with a larger brush I'll oftentimes cut one down into a point just to give it a little bit more control when I'm working with it but the more pressure you apply obviously that point is going to uh, make a larger diameter mark so um, they come in different sizes like this two inch brush obviously I can get some large strokes with it but I can also get thin lines with it and I can also use just the tip of it and you know kind of anchor my pinky there and get different brush strokes or thinner lines as well uh, but like I said the uh, by chopping off the tip of it to a thinner point allows you to get even thinner brush strokes or thinner marks as well. Thin enough that you hardly even see them. You can achieve some really thin lines with, obviously not doing anything super in depth here, uh, but you can get lots of different patterns and designs, thin and thick with uh, a foam tip brush. So don't discount it just because uh, it looks cheap. It is cheap. They're very cheap. And the one thing that I'll say is these brushes, when you get them, they have, they're usually wood handle uh, and they have a, a plastic kind of insert skeleton inside that is the foam encloses around. And that's the foam is, is bonded to that piece of plastic with um, some really weak glue. So as, as this starts to heat up, that glue will release. So that's why you see I have uh, put staples in most of these. And so I'm stapling right into that, that plastic frame in order to secure them from, from slipping off and man overboard into your wax melter. Tool number two that you probably also have lying around is just regular old paint brushes. And caveat, any brush that you do you know, dip into this wax is from here on out just going to be a wax brush. You're never going to be able to get enough wax off of it to go back and use it for especially something like a watercolor or something like that. Um, natural bristle brushes is what you're looking for, which mainly comes into play if you're using higher temperature waxes. You might think that with the amount of you know feathers and things that I do in my work that I would use a lot of natural bristle brushes, but believe it or not, you know I, I, I am batiking probably 300 days out of the year, and I can count the number of times I'm using a foam bristle brush, or excuse me, a, a natural bristle paint brush on one hand. It's just not a tool that finds its way into my arsenal. And so there's nothing wrong with this. The one thing that I do say that I don't really like about it is, you know, because they're just, there's not a lot of place to hold the wax in a, in a regular old paintbrush. Uh, and so you, you're going a lot more back and forth. So if I'm zoomed in real close, trying to get a lot of work out of a, a specific piece, um, a, a paintbrush doesn't really do the trick for me. Some people love it because it gives you a lot more gradations in the wax, especially as you... Um, you know, play with that mark making technique. So getting into some of the more complex tools that you'll probably have to work for or go out and get. Uh, the most traditional tool here are your copper jantings and that's T-J-A-N-T-I-N-G if you're looking them up um, trying to find a source for them. I sourced mine from well, a couple different places. These both came from Dharma Trading uh, this isn't a, a sponsor video in any, in any way uh, or an affiliate video, but that's just where I get them. They're a great company to get most of your dye supplies and batik supplies from. So if you're starting out, you know, this one's probably like two bucks to order online. This one's probably like six bucks to order online. Um, spring for the better one. 
So if you've never seen one before, uh, there's a copper chamber in here that holds the wax and there's a spout at the bottom, looks basically just like a, a water spigot on a microscopic level. Then, you know, you just give it a good scoop. And then I always have a paper towel handy when I'm using a genting because it's, it's, a, it's a faucet, so it's constantly dripping. The nice thing about these is as long as they don't get clogged, which they do sometimes get clogged, you end up getting a pretty uniform line weight if that's something you're looking for. And this is, you know, the traditional tool. So for some people, that's the tool they want to use. I like it for certain detailed things. If I'm doing lettering as well, um, I, I will use it for, for doing, doing letters. Um, but other than that, it, to me, the issue with it is, is it's constantly flowing. And if I want to take a step back and say, what do I want to do next? I, to have to be also be worried about keeping those drips away from my piece. I would rather have something that's uh, a little bit easier to manage. So that's the genting, the traditional tool. Uh, pros are, it's the traditional tool and it gives you a really nice even line weight. And it's great for doing a lot of like outlining and then painting. So if I wanted to do uh, the sort of thing where like, if you're doing multiple iterations and you know, you wanted to do lots of designs that you're then going to paint one color versus another color. Um, it's good for that sort of a thing. I have no idea what that is. My favorite tool. It's technically a genting. This is the tool that I originally learned with. Um, this is a West African style genting. And it uh, basically functions like an old fashioned fountain pen. Um, I make these myself. Uh, these are actually made from recycled old foam brushes they start out with. And then what this is, is this is lamp wire. You can go to the hardware store and cut probably like three feet of lamp wire will get you a number of gentings that you can use. And sorry to cut in here, but as I was editing this video, I realized it would probably be better to have a separate tutorial on how I make this genting in particular. I do use it a lot, but I think it would be better to show you a more in-depth process and how they're made. Uh, if you have made it to this point, though, and you've enjoyed what you've seen and maybe learned a few things or two, go ahead and give me a like or a follow and make sure to stay tuned for the rest of those videos as they come out. Back to the video. And so what that does is all the little microscopic channels between the individual strands of copper, that'll hold your wax. I can hold it more like I would hold a pencil or a paintbrush, which I learned uh, you know, from the beginning. That's how I learned to draw and to paint, is by using you know, a, a traditional drawing or a painting tool. Whereas if I'm using the traditional genting tool, I'm holding the tool in a more non-traditional way. You know, some people do sketch like this with the pencil uh, and an overhand grip. You know, the muscle memory is important. So it's using a different set of muscles than, um, you know, I'm used to using. So you know, once you get comfortable with one or the other, I'm guessing you'll probably stick with one or the other. Uh, but for me, that's the main reason I like this tool is I can hold it in a more traditional sense and I can still get um, a lot of different line weights, whether it's thin lines, thick lines. I also really like using the copper ones because I do a lot of gestural mark making and the different widths, I can use this to make some really um, abstract gestural kind of brush strokes. It's great for stippling too, if you're trying to create um, like a broad simulated texture in your piece. The downside you'll see there is this one, you'll be getting a lot of drips as well too. I think you get less drips with this, uh, but they are a little bit more unpredictable. And it's one of those things that just comes with uh, time and practice, knowing kind of almost like feeling when one's about to drop. And again, having like a paper towel there in order to uh, protect it from, from happening. Uh, last one. Tool number five, which good luck finding one, I doubt you will. It's called a Ladao, L-A-D-A-O. And it comes from direct from uh, hill tribes of Southeast Asia. So Hmong uh, batik artists and I think Miao batik artists use a tool like this 
in there. Uh, they used to do a lot of indigo dyeing, and this is the tool that they use for a lot of their work. And it's basically, it's kind of like a, a combination of, of the last two gentings. Uh, it's using, but it's using copper plates that are folded over on itself and, and, and cinched really tight. But what this one does that no other tool could really come close to is doing this sort of a thing. Straight lines. You really can't beat the precision of this tool. Um, but it does more than that. It also surprisingly gets very little drippage. I can use the top point here to get really thin lines in a drawing style fashion similar to my West African genting. And I can also use it, the bottom point, to get uh, really thin lines similar to the more traditional genting. So just to review the five different ones that you got, uh, your Ladao, L-A-D-A-O, your different kinds of copper gentings, uh, your homemade one, you should be able to make one of these. You probably have an old appliance lying around that you could make one of these from. Uh, you'll definitely probably have to source these online. And then the two that you'll probably, or you should definitely be able to find close to home, uh, your natural bristle brushes and your foam brushes. Thanks for listening. If you found this useful in any kind of way, please like or follow Bay Fiber Studio uh, and share the video with anybody who you want to go on a batik journey with. Uh, thanks for watching.